Okay, we're going to talk next. So we talked, if we look back, we had a general intro to information visualization, and then we went straight into hierarchical data. This is really uh, trying to access the deep recesses of your memory. <laughs> then we looked at graphs, and now we're talking about n-dimensional data, also called multivariate data and high dimensional data. So there are three phrases that really mean or point to the same thing just to confuse you as much as possible. So these are usually used interchangeably. N dimensional data meaning an arbitrary number of dimensions, multivariate data. There's no like exact definition of multivariate data, but in my mind, I think of it as data with three or four variates and higher. And then high dimensional data might be data with even more variates, for example, 10. But in practice, these phrases are used kind of interchangeably. They're not very um, precise. So here's an example of an n-dimensional data visualization, a scatter plot, which you're welcome to use in assignment one. So we have an x-axis with weight. We have a y-axis with average size. And then we have color mapped to another, another variant called horsepower. Anybody want to guess what that data is? Any, any? Gearheads or motorheads in the audience? Horsepower? Does that, does anybody associate horsepower with something? Horsepower weight and average size. I guess everybody's hung over <laughs> from Sunday. This is cars. These are cars. So three attributes of cars. Yep, weight, average size, and horsepower. So for you can see like outliers with high horsepowers in the middle with some something like an average weight and an average size. But you can also kind of see that as not not exactly, but as weight and size go down, horsepower tends to go up. So this is an example of trying to trying to see three variants at the same time. We could expand that into a scatter, scatter plot matrix. So that scatter plot was limited to three variates. This one also happens to be limited to three variates. It's taking each, each attribute and plotting it three times on the x-axis and then the same three variates on the y-axis. So retail price, average size, and horsepower retail price, average size, and horsepower. And that results in kind of a diagonal that's not very interesting. That's the variant plotted against itself. So retail price against retail price, which is not very interesting. And same with average size and horsepower. What's more interesting are these three, these three scatter plots, for example, retail price versus average size. You know, and we can see that as price goes up, so does the size generally. And same with horsepower. And these are symmetrically equivalent to these. These are just a reflection of these. So if we rotate this one by 180 degrees, we get that one. And if we rotate this one by 180 degrees, we get that one in the same form. So there's, that's a reflection symmetry. So we really, uh, there's some redundant information there, but you can imagine having five, six, or seven uh, dimensions there, a higher number of dimensions, which is better than just something like a pie chart. But you can also imagine that if this was 10 dimensions, this, the, uh, the scatter plots would have to reduce in size. So there's a scalability kind of challenge there. 
right? The more dimensions you have, the more the scatter plots have to shrink in size. Here's a more sophisticated scatter plot matrix. This is from Tableau, I think. Pretty sure it's from Tableau. And it's more sophisticated in the in the sense that it has interaction and, and those sorts of things. So the user can actually click on any individual data sample. And that data sample will show up in all the different all the different matrix combinations, and then the actual data is shown in a in a on mouse over um, fashion. So we can see that this this ellipse corresponds to this exact vehicle, the Honda Insight 2DR, with 66 miles per gallon and this weight and this wheelbase and so on. So it's interactive. We can't see the interaction in, in this static slide, but I could just move my mouse around and then see all the details of the different data items. That would be fun for assignment one as well. This is definitely Tableau, by the way. I recognize the interface. Here is a three-dimensional scatter plot example. Now, the, if something is 3D, so there are, there's an axis here, city miles per gallon, engine size, and this one is horsepower again. So there are three axes, and these points are in a three-dimensional space. So that's why it's called a 3D scatter plot. Now, in order for this to be more useful, there are really two properties necessary than a 2D scatter plot. One is the ability to rotate the volume. That's really essential. If you cannot rotate the volume, it's going to be very difficult to perceive. And that's because depth is hard to perceive, especially with these points. In fact, on this projection, it's impossible. I, I, don't, I don't believe that anybody can perceive the depth on this particular example. If you rotate it, though, you can. You can find out depth information. Another thing that would make it more useful is if these uh, points were shaded glyphs, like shaded spheres then there would be some more depth information and you'd be able to perceive those three-dimensional, the three-dimensional nature of this space more clearly if you added lighting and shading. Here's another example of a multivariate data visualization with an arbitrary number of variates, and this is something you could use in assignment one as well, a stacked bar chart. So every variate is, is plotted to a bar, so this is the same variance, and then the bars are stacked on top of one another. So this is education, here there's the legend, and then the next green one is called Creative Arts, his History, Languages, and so on. This is a data set of universities along the x-axis, so Welsh universities, our favorite universities in the world, right, Welsh universities. It's surprising how many there are, isn't it? Those are all Welsh universities. And the subjects that they teach, or the, the, the uh, the things that they do. You know. So we could look at Avariswith and find out that they, you can study education, creative arts, history, languages, and some other things, uh, business, law, and, and so on. And we can compare the, the number of students enrolled in each of those topics. And then you notice like there's one with nothing. <laughs> That's the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. So like music and drama is not encoded in this legend, so it's not appearing. 
but there, there I can I can conclude with confidence that nobody is studying business here because there's no bar with business, and you can start to make some observations about you know who studies what at the different universities. <clears throat> A stacked graph or a stack, this is also called an area chart. It's similar to a line graph, except the, every variant is represented by an area. So for example, again, this is the same data set. It's the Welsh universities on the x-axis. And the number of students studying each topic on the y-axis. So if I can get the colors right, it, then I can see, for example, there are a small number of students studying, it looks like, uh, it's, it's, the colors are hard to see here because there, uh, there are so many categories. But th there are a small number of students studying education at, at, at Westwood. So, and suddenly that number jumps up in Cardiff some reason and this is the uh, the music the music one again missing I don't know why the label is missing maybe because it just didn't fit does everybody know what Swansea Metropolitan University is by the way everybody knows that okay good that's right it's the former University of Wales Trinity St. David Anybody remember what it was called before Swansea Metropolitan University? Nobody remembers? That's interesting. I, I'm not 100% sure either. I heard at one point it was called Swansea Institute. Does, any, does that ring a bell with anybody? It sounds bad. The, like Swansea Correctional Institute. Anyways, probably that's why, maybe that's why they changed the name. Here's a matrix chart. Same data set again. Universities in Wales on the x-axis and the number of, in this case we have number of postgraduate students on, on the y-axis and the number of undergraduate students on the y-axis. So you, we can compare undergraduate versus postgraduate student population. And for a research university, actually, you, research universities are trying to get higher numbers of postgraduate students. So in this case, Cardiff has the, the, the largest number. These numbers have changed. This is, I believe, from 2014, around 2014. <clears throat> But these are the kind of statistics that are used to compare universities with one another. So those are some, just some examples of n-dimensional or multivariate or high-dimensional visualization aspects. And you can use all of those in your assignment one. We're going to go over some more, and we're going to start talking about glyphs. That's part of the next. Any any questions so far? Oh, I forgot to uh, pass this around. You have a question. What's your name? Yes, that's right. That's right. The images are, are evidence that you did it, not proof. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But evidence, yes. And, and if you were to do something in 3D, for example, in assignment one, it would be very good to show two images, like 
of one from one perspective and then one rotated 30 degrees or something like that. And if you want, you, you could maybe show interaction by, you know, taking a screen capture during the interaction or something. But maybe, maybe next year, what I should have done is said, okay, one of your, one of your uh, results has to show interaction with a video, like where you have to upload a video to Vimeo or YouTube, and then I get to see the see the interaction. I wish I had thought of that <laughs> already. Maybe, hopefully, next year I will I will think of that. So, uh, the glyphs or, or uh, are symbols? Question? Yeah, um, just, uh, on the earlier slide, the stack bar chart. Yeah. Has, yeah, yeah, that data missing. Is there, um, is there a problem if uh, on the coursework there might be um, a little piece missing? Um, or is that something you don't really want as much? You, if there's some hole like this, you would just want to explain why the hole is there. As long as you explain why and it's logical, like this is logical, I, I would say, then um, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. And that's, it's kind of like, what's kind of interesting about this is, yeah, this music, school of music sticks out. Like, what's the whole? Well, that's the, fu that's the funny thing about data visualization. You notice errors immediately. Like, anything that's unusual sticks out immediately. And I had no idea that there was a music school in Wales. I had no idea before I made this image. Didn't even know it existed. So it's like very educational, actually, those, those kinds of occurrences. Did anybody else know that that existed before? Like, <laughs> show off. <laughs> where, where is it? I don't think it's in the center part. Okay. Okay. Next to Phoenix Park Gardens, the gardens, the castle. I know the castle. Yeah, it's know. like a big park behind it. Okay. Okay. So glyphs are symbols, discrete symbols that have different characteristics that are mapped to data. Right. The the, the most the ones that you're used to are probably from traffic um, or like the skull and the crossbones on your favorite products like th there really shouldn't be any products in your house with skull and crossbones on them but we still buy that stuff even though it can kill us <laughs> anyways these are so-called Chernoff faces and, and I have to like mention them because this is a data visualization class. I'm still not sure if these are like serious or, or not. But you can see that you can use glyphs to encode several variables. So in this case, the glyphs have a position, which is on the X, you know, and the Y reflects the X and the Y axis. So those are two variants being being conveyed. Now the, the shape of the head and the curvature of the head is changing depending on which one you're looking at. So like this one is round and this one is not so round. So shape and, incur and curvature encode a variant. Also size Size is not really changing in this example, but it could change as another variant. The length of the mouths is changing, right? This one has a small mouth and this one has a long mouth. The curvature of the mouths is also changing. So like this one's happy. Do we have an unhappy one somewhere? That one's not very happy. <laughs> The nose length is changing and the curvature is also changing. So here we can see longer nose lengths, longer nose lengths. And, and the curvature could change if we wanted it to. The eyes are also changing. So you can see the shape and the thickness of these eyes is different than these ones. The orientation here is changing. 
Color is absent, but color could also be used as a variant XY position. I looked up this paper. This is a very old paper that's highly cited. And it's, it's originally used for eight variants to encode eight variants visually all at the same time. And it's to encode fossil specimens. So 1973 is when this was published by the American Statistical Institute. And there are kind of discussions about whether or not this is kind of something that was done just for fun or if it's actually like purposeful science or not. But it's a good example of, of using glyphs to encode data at least. Here is another kind of glyph called a star glyph and we're going to talk more about this one. But there's each axis in this star encodes a variant. So here there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight variants again. And along each axis, is this, at the center is the minimum value, and at the edge is the maximum value, the outer edge. And so if we have eight variants, we can draw a polyline from connecting each axis, and that represents eight variables at the same time. And it's hard to actually see what's going on here because the, the space is very small and the polylines are overlapping. We're going to come back to this more, actually, as we progress. Here's a vector glyph example. And it's a little bit better. This example is a better version of that kind of version of from the introduction when we were talking about data dimensionality and visualization dimensionality. So this is seven variants at the same time. So we have x, y, and z position. That's three. This is a flat surface, by the way, but this has curvature. So the depth is actually changing in z. And then we have three vector variants of v, x, v, y, and v, z at each position. And then we have magnitude. So magnitude is the length of the vector. And that's encoded both in the size of the lip itself, but also in the color. So it's a redundant, a redundant, uh, well, no, I take that back. It's only encoded in the, the color. It's not encoded in the size. I take that back. So the size is something else, which I haven't mentioned on this, on this slide. So it's a missing variant, actually. Here's another example of a less familiar glyph. This is what the glyph looks like. It's showing a representative vector from a group of vectors. So this is a representative vector of all the vectors inside this <coughs> cluster. So we have eight variants visualized, the position, x, y, and z again, the three components of the velocity, the magnitude, and also something called an angle range. So all of the vectors in this cluster are pointing in this direction with a range encoded by this ring. So they, they vary in direction by that much, by the range indicated in the ring, or this, this span of angles. So it's called a range glyph. Here's another variation on a very similar thing, theme, another range glyph, but this time it is a vector magnitude range. So there are six variants here that each glyph, this is what the glyph looks like, by the way. Each glyph has a position in x, y, and z space, and it has a velocity range, which is the minimum. The minimum is encoded by the inner ring. That's the minimum velocity magnitude. And the maximum is encoded by the outer ring, which is the 
the maximum velocity magnitude of all the vectors inside a cluster. And these regions of uniform color are clusters of glyphs instead of a single glyph. So that's just another example of, of uh, a glyph. Right? We're going through lots of examples of high dimensional glyphs. And these are combinations of the range glyphs, the two different range glyphs. So that the vector magnitude glyph, but also the vector, uh, the theta range glyphs inside. So there are nine variants visualized there. So the more variants you have, the more complicated the glyphs are. Any rugby fans here? Anybody here watch rugby? This is an alternative way to look at and analyze a rugby game. So this is a glyph and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, eight variants, if I counted that correctly. The, the pictogram in the middle indicates the type of event like a, a, a turnover or a try or, or some a, a pass. This, this, this um, edge represents the event duration for every rugby event. So there's, there's one glyph that represents every event in a rugby game. And the start time is at midnight and the, the angle that this edge his position represents the time that the event started. <clears throat> so the start time is encoded at this angle, and then the duration is encoded by the thickness of the edge. And the tortuosity of the player carrying the ball is represented by this curvy gray line on the outer edge. Anybody ever heard that word tortuosity before? So this is a brand new word for everybody. Tortuosity is a measure of how much a path deviates from a straight line. So if you're a rugby player, you want to run in a straight line towards the opponent's goal. But nobody runs in a straight line because all the defense is in the way, so you run in a curved path and the amount of curvature is called tortuosity. See, I taught you something about rugby today. <laughs> For you rugby plants. The territory start position is mapped to radius, so wherever you started, the, the events start on the field. The contour color identifies the team, since there are, there are two teams, so there are going to be two different contour colors. The net lateral movement is represented as an arrow width. So in an ideal game, you want to run straight down, longitudinally down the field, but in actuality, you end up running latitudinally. And the amount of lateral movement is encoded by the width of this this aeroglyph. The number of phases, that's a special property of the rugby game. A direction arrow showing the orientation of the motion. This is the type of event like I mentioned before. And then the amount of gain towards the opponent's territory is mapped to the inner color. And these are actually all the dimensions we're looking at in the, for each of the rugby events here. And this is, these are encoded by the glyphs. And this is what it looks like. This is how the glyphs vary when you start looking at the different attributes over their range. So gain, ultimately, what you want for every rugby event is to maximize the gain. That's the object of the game. So if we see a glyph with a red 
a red loop like this, a red inner loop, then it means the team went backwards, right, away from the offensive end. And then the color varies, and this is a, a positive event for the offense, so to speak. We can see that this event resulted in major gains. And we can do the same thing with the pictogram. So this is the event type. This is a kick reception, a line out, a turnover, a scrum, and penalty. So these are the, the five most popular events. The territory start position is encoded by this ring, this outer ring. So this is the defensive end of the of the territory start position, and here's what it looks like when we start in the the attacking third or the offensive end of the territory start position. Here's the tortuosity that I mentioned, so the curvature of the outer ring increasing the more the, the player's path deviates from a straight line. The number of phases is, is a simple number from 1 to n. The direction of the net movement of the ball is encoded by this arrow, the orientation of the arrow. The net lateral movement is encoded by the width of the arrow, you can see here, and so on. The time the event occurred and the duration of the event. And then we can actually plot those glyphs on a scatter plot. And the, the, these axes can represent any arbitrary glyph dimension. So, for example, here's time on the x-axis from 0 to 100 minutes, and gain on the y-axis. And these glyphs with the, ha the purple halos are actually represent tries, or where the points are scored. Okay. So, in this example, I can see some outlier events where there were huge gains, like this event was the most successful in terms of gains, but it didn't actually result in any points. Right. And we can see, for example, a big gap, this big gap, anybody know what that big gap is? Half time, exactly. And we can pick up some patterns and trends immediately by showing a rugby game. So this is an entire rugby game, all the events in a rugby game, and now you can see them in just a second, rather than having to watch 90 minutes of footage and look for patterns. And we can use those scatter plots to compare different games with one another. Right, and, and we can compare the events with one another. These bars represent the average the average value of whatever the y-axis is plotted. In this case, it's gain on both y-axes. And you can see a full tutorial and demo of, of that system on, on the module YouTube channel. So if you want to see like a, a long discussion in detail about the rugby you can see that on the on the, the channel so there's a full lecture just about that rugby stuff there if you're a rugby fan okay what time is it uh, probably this is not a bad place to stop. Any questions about n-dimensional data? That's a big lecture for assignment one. Like you just got spammed with a lot of possibilities for assignment one now. Question? Do we get some tools to plot these sort of data? Any ideas? Maybe for the next lecture. Well, that's a, I never give a lecture on the actual tools, except for Tableau. Tableau, um, you, know, you can watch the tutorial online. You already know how to use Excel. 
So you got two. You just have to figure out one more. But yeah. So I've got a question. Um, um, you know you said like it should be multivariate data. So if we have two project typo and we did when I think it's like a bubble chart of worlds, but of one disease, is that not useful? It depends. The assumptions there's no bubble charts. Yeah. If you put the I was just playing around. Yeah. 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 Geospatial like, like, yeah. 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 bits. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, a bit of one variable, one disease. Is that, yeah. I guess okay. it just shows something. That's okay yeah. because you have the digital map. So, you have two variables the location and then the radius of each policy. The position. It's actually like a scatter plot, you know, if you think about it. Oh, yeah, it's not the whole world. 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 It's not the